So, Father, we love you, we worship you, and give us the wisdom to have ears to hear, eyes to see, and the ability, Father, to want to do what you tell us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Chapter 4. I love this because here the bridegroom, it's on, Mr. Chris. And now you're going to have to edit that out. I know you are. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, we're actually seeing the bridegroom speaking prophetically about the bride. He's talking about her virtues. And I love this because so often, just like he called her a steed, and I thought, great, he's calling me a horse, and he wants a green couch, those are all meanings that we have to understand, and there's several here that we're going to have to look at. So chapter 4, verse 1. The bridegroom is talking and he's saying, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thine eyes are doves, behind the veils are the locks. Now, this is actually a repetition of what we saw in chapter 1, verse 15. But I'm going to ask you, remember what we said about the dove's eyes. What did that mean? Who wants to speak up and tell me? Oh, it's you again. You're the person I would hate in my class. Someone besides Michelle. What does the dove's eyes mean? Remember? All right, Michelle, tell us. Focused. She is single-minded in her devotion and what he's giving her as revelation. She's not distracted. She's veiled. And what that actually means is she's not looking out of all sides of her eyes. She is focused in on him. And then it goes on, it says, Thy hair is as a flock of goats that lie along the side of Mount Gilead. Again, I took offense to that. He's called me a horse, and now he's calling me a goat. But we have to understand about Mount Gilead. Mount Gilead was actually shaped like a man's head and shoulders. And when these long-haired flocks of goats with fine, beautiful hair would come and lay on the hills of Mount Gilead, it looked like it had beautiful hair. And he's comparing her to that. He's saying, you're not distracted. Your hair is protecting you. You have separated yourself from this world. I mean, it would have been easier if he just would have said that, but I'm sorry, he wants us to dig into the Word and figure it out. Then it goes on with us to understand in verse 2, I love this, your teeth are like a flock of ewes that are newly shorn, and they come up from the washing whereof everyone has twins, and none is bereaved among them. I mean, you see that and go, how is that romantic? How is that prophetic? I don't understand. Well, he's talking about her teeth. And if you look at her teeth, he's saying, you're feeding on the word of God. You are eating of the bread of life. He's also telling her, you're chewing on the meat of the word. I heard someone say before we started, I don't like steak. I am finding that I can't do it as well. And I said, amen, I'm the same way. You know, and I don't think they heard me, but what we're seeing here is he's telling her, you got a hold of my word and you're chewing it and you're no longer on the milk. You've matured. And that's what he's saying, but he continues on. He's telling her that none have been bereaved because of you. He's telling her that not only are your teeth beautiful, that they're white, pure, beautiful, no blemishes, no uh, of uncleanliness or lacking. Another word for that is shalom. Nothing is missing, nothing is lacking. She's saying you have peace. And I'm telling you, you have peace. The Prince of Peace came and moved in your temple. It also says 
that the flock of ewes, again, I wouldn't have known this, city of Mobile, never knew what that meant. You guys do. A flock of ewes are the female flocks, right? And what he is saying here is that this female flock of sheep is a symbol of fruitfulness. He said they're twin bearing. There's none bereaved. He is saying that you, the bride of Christ, is causing the kingdom of God to be multiplied. You're calling in those people that need Jesus. That's what he sees in you. He sees that none is bereaved in this flock. Then verse 3. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy mouth is comely, which also means lovely. Here he is telling her that her lips are covered in the thread of scarlet. Does anybody want to tell me what the thread of scarlet is? Yes. And what did he do for us? He shed the blood of the lamb. And so he's telling her that your lips are the thread of, of, of the beautiful scarlet blood that Jesus laid down for us. And he's also telling us that out of the doors of our mouth, that we should not have anything that comes out that's not acceptable to God. I think we know that. But he's reminding us, don't let this come out of your mouth. As a matter of fact, Psalms 141 verse 3, it says, Set a watch, O God, before my mouth and keep the doors of my lips. We need to watch what we say. Because we need to realize that redemption has covered our mouth with his blood. We have no excuse. But even more than that, if we say, oh, Jesus, let me kiss you with the kisses of my mouth and ugly things come out, I don't know if he wants to be kissed by that. And so we're talking about his desire to be able to have intimacy with us, but we've got some stuff we've got to work on. We need to realize that our lips are covered by his blood. Then he goes on. He says, thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate behind the veil. Now, last time I preached this has been several years ago, and I honestly can tell you I had never touched a pomegranate. And the people that were here were like, oh my goodness, have you ever had a pomegranate? And I honestly said no. So I had to go to Super One and go buy a pomegranate. You know what I discovered? God knows what he's talking about. Okay. First of all, let's go into the temples. The temples, that is of the forehead, are spoken as a seal of boldness and modesty. That's what our temples are. That's what our forehead is. But when he speaks of the pomegranate, he's referring to the red and white center of the fruit after it's cut. And again, I found out the seeds, when they're broken and when they're spilled out, it's the symbol of the blood of the lamb. Now, the next time you have a pomegranate, you're going to look at it differently. But I want you to know you've been broken and spilled out just like he has. It's for this world today. And he gives us an example that's visual. I mean, each one of these are visual because he wants us to understand we are visible to a world that needs Jesus. Amen. We don't think we are, but we are. Then he goes on in chapter 4, verse 4. He says, Thy neck. It is like the tower of David builded for an armory, whereon hangs a thousand bucklers, all the shields of the mighty men. So we're going to break that down. Let's understand what the tower of David was. The tower of David was located at the citadel in Jerusalem. It was the palace and the fortified home of the king. Now you just go, oh, that's sweet. No, I'm telling you this who you are. You are his tabernacle. You are a fortified 
home of the king. And it gives even more description. It says the head and the neck is lifted. It's no longer bent down in embarrassment. It says that that neck is lifted so that you can keep watch of where the enemy is so that you can be victorious. It also says that your neck has chains that show the triumphs and the victories that you've already had. You know, the devil looks at you and you think, well, he's just seen what a bad day I had. He sees that I can't read my small print without my glasses. You know, no, the devil looks at you and he trembles because he knows that you're chained with his glory, that you're no longer bound, and we are no longer bowed over. We've been set free. Amen. That's because what he's done for us. And again, as I said, this is the bridegroom speaking of the virtues that he sees in you, his bride. I even asked Jesse, you know, while we were talking, I said, Jesse, do you ever have an issue? Because I don't think about it. It's easy for me to think that I'm the bride of Christ. And I said, but does a man struggle with that? Do they have a struggle thinking they're the bride of Christ? And he said, no. He said, I know there's no male or female in Jesus. And I thought, perfect answer. I trained you well. <laughs> but guys, we're the bride of Christ. He's preparing us for this day. But more than that, he's preparing you for victory so that in these days ahead, we're not going to sit there and cower and think, well, the devil's won. No, he's defeated in Jesus' name. Amen. I love this. She has been called to freedom. And we see that, that the bride and the bridegroom are talking about how they have been equipped for this time. It's talking about the armor of God. We see that in Ephesians. Then it goes on, verse 5. The bridegroom is speaking, I'm sorry, yeah, the bridegroom's speaking here. He said, your two breasts are like two fawns that are twins of a row, which feedeth among the lilies. Okay, who are the lilies? Don't you say a word, Michelle. <laughs> who are the lilies? Thank you, Ingrid. The pure in heart. And the pure in heart will what? See God. See God. So we're seeing here which feed among the lilies. The two breasts are the two fawns. And we're also going to discover here the breast of the bride is the same as the breastplate of righteousness as a Christian that we get to wear. And we're going to understand this even further because I'm going to give you scripture. Because what it's speaking of is the twin breast of faith and love. Now, first of all, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 5 verse 6. I'm going to have this as homework for you. Because it says, faith worketh by what? Love. Just say it again. Faith worketh by what? Love. So there's the twin breast. If I have faith and I don't have love, then I'm not going to be able to have what I need with the body of Christ, with my armor on. Then it goes on, Paul says, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 4, he said he has heard of their faith in Jesus and their love towards all saints. There we go again. Faith and love. It's the twins. And this is what we have to have so that we can be pure in heart is faith and love. Say faith and love. Faith and love. We have to have it. If I don't have love, then my faith is going to stink. And if I have love and have no faith, I'm not going to be able to see what God's called me to do. They work together. They're powerful twins. Then in verse 6, the bride speaks. She says, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away, I will get me, underline that, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. And you're sitting there going, okay, I don't understand that. Well, it will be understanding when we break it down. So let's do that. The mountain of myrrh 
is a symbol of the tomb where the Lord laid until he rose from the dead. Now what that actually means is it shows the redemptive work of the cross. Okay, I have a reason that we're taking this little journey. Then we're talking about the hill of frankincense. What we're seeing here is accepting his love into our life. But it symbolizes the cross of Calvary, which he offered himself. So we see these two things. We see the tomb and we see the cross. And what we're actually seeing here is that he's telling her, you, my friend, have to climb that hill of frankincense. You are going to have to go to the, the mountain of myrrh. It means you are a living sacrifice. If we don't clean out our hearts, we're not going anywhere. And we see this as though we need to understand that the cost is great. And Romans 12, 1 said, Are you willing to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God? That's what the bride is saying. I'm willing. I am willing to pay the price because he ultimately paid the price. And here the bridegroom is saying, come away with me. I want you to understand that there's more than just saying some things. You have to do some things. And that is kill your flesh. Doesn't sound like fun. But what he's saying is become a living sacrifice. And as soon as she sees and says this, the bridegroom says to her in verse 7, chapter 4, he said, you are fair, my love. There is no spot in you. Whenever I hear that, I get real emotional because I know there's some spots on me. But what he is saying is I have redeemed you and it's a miracle of my redemption. And here we also says, you are all fair, my love. There is no spot in you. He is assuring her of his love. He is assuring her of the blood that has cleansed her. He has made her, and I'm not going to break into song, whiter than snow. That's what he's done for us. Yeah, we can remember the times that we have messed up, but he doesn't because the blood has covered us. We have been made whiter than snow. He is tenderly assuring her that he loves her and he's redeemed her. This miracle of redemption. Then after he tells her this in verse 8, he says, come away with me. Come away from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shinar and Hermon from the lion's den and from the mountains of the leopards. Again, we got to break this down, but you're going to help me on this one. Now, Lebanon was a border mountain that was between the enemy's uh, country and the promised land. The part that I was shocked to learn is that this area was never conquered by the Hebrews. That's what he's speaking of. But he's trying to say as a symbol that it's a borderline between the world and heaven. It's a borderline between compromise and having fidelity to God. He's also saying it's a borderline of being half-hearted and also being one who desires to be his. It's what he's saying. That's why Lebanon is the one that is mentioned. Now, who would like to tell me what the lion represents? Not you, Michelle. What does the lion represent? Oh, I can't hear you guys. What? That would be wrong, Mike. Thank you. The lion of the triad, no Judah. No, it's not. Because he's taking her away from Lebanon. He's taking her out of this place she doesn't belong. He's taking her and saying, these things are here and I don't want you to be a part of it. 
So what's the other lion that is mentioned in the scripture? Oh, like a, like a roaring lion. Thank you. Uh, and so we're seeing that he's taking her away. Come away with me from this area. Because the lion is a symbol of the lion that is ready to devour us. So she's, he's saying, I'm taking you away from them. He wants her to be taken away. And then look at the next part. He mentions the leopard. Does anyone know anything about a leopard? What is it, Haley? I still didn't hear you. Oh, okay. Well, it's true. There are spots on a leopard. But also the leopard in Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, is an emblem of the Antichrist. Doesn't that make sense? I'm taking you away from the roaring lion. I'm taking you away from the leopard that's an emblem of the Antichrist. And I want you, he's saying, come away with me. I want you, my dear, beautiful bride, to leave all the places where you didn't grow. And I want you to come with me. He is saying, I desire for you to have a habitation with me. Come and you will desire me and you will truly run after me. I love this scripture because he's saying you don't have to stay in these places where you were hurt. You don't have to stay here and have the lion and the leopard consume you. You've been redeemed, which we had already talked about in the previous verse of 7. He says, I want you to reach the purpose that I have for you. Now, after he says this, I love verse 9. He's saying, you, my bride, have ravished and stolen my heart. My sister, my bride, you have ravished my heart with one look from your eyes and one chain off your neck. I love that. He is saying, my desire is for you. He's saying, you looked at me, you had the pureness of heart, but even more than that, I've noticed that you have chains on your neck, which tells me you're taking on my attributes. You're ready to fight the enemy. You are ready to have the attributes and the sword of the spirit so that you can see the enemy defeated in your life. I am so excited when I read this scripture and we're going to just kind of understand that this scripture literally summarizes this whole book. Because what it's saying is so often people do not realize that God, he is ravished by you. He desires you. He wants to spend time with you. And that definition of a ravished heart, what does he mean by that? He's saying, you have given me joy. You have fulfilled the destiny that I have for you. Now, to go even a step further, when reading the Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 9, the first thing I want to do is respond by thanking God that he has given me his promises. But more than that, thank you, God, that I have ravished your heart. So we're going to take a time. You know, this isn't so much just about study. This is about meeting with the king. We've said, draw me. And then I love it in the previous verses. He's telling us, come with me. Take you out of all those areas. And then he tells us, you've ravished my heart. And I want you to say this prayer with me, Jesus. Say it again, Jesus. Jesus. Show me more, Show me more. How, I how I can ravish your heart. Oh my gosh. That's what he wants. He wants to separate you from those things that you don't need to be a part of. Then in verse 10, he says, How fair, beautiful, and bright is thy love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love more than one? We read that the first chapter. But as I looked at a translation that I finally found that I love, it's Jesus saying, 
Our love is more beautiful to me than the splendor of my creation. I found that, and I'll tell you what, I just stopped and started weeping. That's what he thinks about us. That's what he does for us. And it goes on, it says, The fragrance of thine oils more than the manner of spices. He's telling her above all earthly goods that I can see and that I created. Yes, that's important. I'm telling you that I count your love and what I did on the cross more than anything else. He's telling her, yeah, I suffered. Yes, I spilled my blood, but it's because I love you. He's also telling that her fragrance is beautiful. If we remember in chapter 1, verse 3, the bride rejoices in the smell of his fragrance. But now, in chapter 4, verse 10, he's rejoicing in her fragrance. Guys, I, I want to have it to where the king comes to me, and he doesn't have to make it all fancy and frilly. I just want him to tell me, Denise, you stink pretty with my, with my smell, with my love, with my joy. That's what he desires of us. He is rejoicing over her. He's saying the fruit of the Spirit is just dwelling in you and it's making everything around you smell lovely. Let's look at verse 11. He says, Thy lips, O my bride, drops as the honeycomb, Honey and milk are under your tongue. Now, I'm going to ask you, have you ever heard anything about honey and milk before in the Bible? Where? Tell me. Promised land. Somebody said promised land. That would be Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. Remember, they were promised that it would be a land of milk and honey. And here he is saying that honey and milk are under your tongue. What he's trying to tell us in these days that we're living in is that underneath our tongue is the promise. Hallelujah. You and I have been given the ability to have honey and milk, the promised land, under our tongue. And we need to realize that's the reason why we have to have a thread of scarlet. That's the reason why we need to be cautious of what we say. Because every attribute that the bride is now receiving has been perfected so that she can be like him. There's honey and milk under your tongue. There's honey and the promise of him under our tongue. And then it goes on in verse 11. And the smell of your garments is like the smell of Lebanon. Again, I had to understand what it was being said, but Lebanon, if you remember, we talked about the wood. We talked about the wood being fragrant, that it was growing strong. And he is declaring that she is growing strong, but now she has a fragrance about her, and that's because she's put on his divine garments. Guys, I want to get in his clothes. I want him to have me and me to have him. We are now being hidden away. Another verse I wanted to give you with the honey being under our tongue, honey and milk, it's Proverbs 16, 24. It says, Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to our bones. Now, I love it because the next verses of 12 through 15 of chapter 4, he's talking about her fruit. And we're going to be discussing nine fruits. Can anyone tell me what other nine fruits there are in the Word of God? What? Fruit of the Spirit. That's what he's describing. He's breaking it down. He's telling her... I want you to come out from where you are. I'll read 12 through 15. It says, A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, 
a fountain sealed. Your plants are an orchid of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, camphor and spinkered, spinkered and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all types of trees of frankincense, myrrh, and aloes, with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living water, and flowing streams of Lebanon. He's describing her as being full of the fruit of the Spirit. He's calling her out and saying, that garden that you have is your promised land. Right now, you're planting a garden. Now, I have to laugh because my husband has decided we're going to have a garden this year. And right now, all we have successfully done is had dirt in our backyard. And he keeps telling me every day, he said, I can't wait to plant. And then I've been told the planting season is extremely slow here. And it's quick and it's over. And I think so often, isn't it great that God gave me a lot of years to be able to achieve and to walk into the fruit of His Spirit? He wants us to plant a garden, our garden where He is welcome to come. Goes on, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. The spring is the fountain of life and the source of living water. He is saying, drink of me and you will never thirst again. That's what he's saying. He goes on and he said that you have to understand that I'm a shut up fountain sealed because of my death, burial, burial, and resurrection. And then he talks about the flowing streams from Lebanon. Now that is actually talking about the snow-capped mountains that are there in Lebanon. He's saying that that is a pure and beautiful stream. It's not in any way a place where you lose the purified water that he has provided for us. Then he goes on, a garden enclosed whose springs are undefiled. It points to a pure heart that is reserved only for Jesus. That's what he desires from us. So again, we're going to take a moment because each one of these steps are so important because we're getting to the end of this, which to me is the most beautiful part of chapter 4. But we need to pray this very simple prayer. Say, Jesus, Jesus, my heart heart is locked to all compromise. compromise. I I am fully yours. Compromise means you're not going to see the promise. And here we see that the bridegroom is calling out some things in her. She is actually, before we get into this next part of verse 16, we're seeing that she is in his manifested presence. She's crying out to the Holy Spirit, the wind of his presence, to come in and change some things. Verse 16 is literally the change that she's desiring. And I know throughout the years since I first started this, I use this scripture so often because I desire for his wind to blow in my life. So let's read chapter 4, verse 16. This is the bride talking. She's matured. And she's become sealed in his presence. She doesn't want compromise. It says, Awake, O north wind, and come you south. Blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit. What she's saying is, I no longer just want to take from you, I want to give to you. You know, so often when you and I pray, and I'm guilty probably more than you, I'm like, God, here's my list, this is what needs to get done. But all of a sudden, her heart's changed. She's saying, I want to give you the gifts. I want you to come into my garden so that I can give you pleasant fruit. I want you to be glorified. 
But then it even goes on. She desires to give back to him. But the wind that she's speaking of is the lifting power of the Holy Spirit. That's the same thing with us. When we pray that the winds of the Spirit will come in, we're saying lift us up to where we can touch you. Then it goes on, it says the divine activity that she's crying out for is that she is desiring to be lifted into the kingdom of God. Now just like I have said in the past, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. She's calling down heaven. You and I have been given that. Jesus taught us how to pray that way. So often we don't, and we need to say, Father, lift me up so that we can pray down heaven on earth. Now, I want you to also notice that it's changed from my gardens to his gardens. She knows that things have changed. But she is asking for the north wind to blow. The north wind is correction. And I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to stand corrected. I don't like it. But the Holy Ghost wants to correct us so that we can do what he's called us to do. And then the south wind is to give us direction. Again, if we were to have a show of hands, how many of us need directions? We'd be raising our hands and waving it. But first we need to have the correction before the direction comes. What she was saying was blow Holy Spirit, blow in my life. I want you and I want nothing else. And when the bride prayed, awake, O north wind, she was giving permission not just to the Father and the Son, but to the Holy Spirit. She is saying, blow upon me. I mean, this, this is the most powerful scripture that I have ever seen in my life. She's encouraging the Holy Spirit to bring about the needed change within her life. She wants to flow in harmony. Can you imagine that? Flowing in harmony with the Holy Spirit? I wonder if that works. Yeah, it does. And that's what she's asking for. She's saying, I desire to flow with you. I desire for you to nip here, tuck there, and then also give me the direction that I'm supposed to go. And that's what she's saying. She's saying, whatever the cost. What, say whatever the cost. Whatever the cost. I desire to flow in harmony with you. Say that. So let's get this down in our heart again. The north wind was to change her so that she could become the bride who truly pleased the Lord. And then after she responded to the north wind, he's going to send to us this beautiful warmth and comfort so that the south wind can come in and we can rest in his presence. He's not just going to whip you around and not give you the rest in his presence. Now, the north and the south winds had an effect on her. And she cried out, let my beloved come to his garden. Let him eat of my pleasant fruit. It's a cry from our hearts. Holy Ghost, come into my garden. Come and eat of my fruit. But then he quickly responds, and we're going to see that. But I want you to understand it's up to us to make this cry. Are you willing to step out and say, awake, O north wind? I don't like correction, like I said. I would mother, much rather him just pat me on the back and say, you've done a great job. But you know, sometimes we need for him to blow into our gardens and correct us. And especially when we're dealing with our flesh. You know, but he will send that north wind to correct. That's the winds of his Holy Spirit. And then he will send his south wind of his spirit to not correct, but to encourage. That's what he desires from us. 
And if you look up the word wind in both Hebrew and the Greek, you want to guess what it means? Spirit. <laughs> that wasn't a hard one to find. And in John chapter 3, verse 8, the word translated wind is the same as the word spirit. I think he's trying to tell us something. I think he's trying to prepare us for the days ahead so that we can have a garden that is enclosed by his living waters and that we are willing to go with what his plans are. But like I said, he quickly responds. She cries out, I have come into my garden. Let my beloved come and eat of his pleasant fruits. And I want you to know when you give him permission, he will quickly show up. And we see, and we're not going to go into it deeply, chapter 5, verse 1. If you will look at that, you will see the bridegroom shows up. He says, I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh and my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. And then I love what he says, eat. Eat, O oh friends, drink ye, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. She asks for correction and she asks for direction and he shows up and he says, I'm going to allow you to be a minister to others. You've allowed me to come into your garden. You've allowed me to make change. And because of that, you are going to be a fruit that people can eat of. I want people to eat of whatever is inside of me that brings him glory. And we're going to see that in the following chapters, we're going to see that, number one, she becomes even more desperate for his touch. But I love it because in chapter 5, verse 2, she decides, you know what, I need a rest. I've become weary. But in that process of coming weary, she gets to get hungry once again. So it's okay sometimes when we make mistakes and we say, you know, I just don't know if I want to go to church. I don't know if I want to spend time. We see this in evidence in chapter 5. And then we also see how the Holy Ghost is going to correct and how he's going to direct. And I don't believe we would ever see a chapter 5 if we would not have seen that of her prayer in chapter 4. So I'm telling you tonight, it's time for each one of us to give him permission, giving permission to the Holy Spirit to come and blow upon our gardens. So in these last remaining moments, again, we're getting out a little bit early. I just want us to just thank him for blowing on our gardens. Father, this is your garden. You've told us to make certain that our lips are covered with the thin veil of scarlet. God, we don't want anything to come out of our lips except which is the word of God. But God, even more than that, I'm asking you that even though we are garden enclosed, that the rivers of living water will flow out of us. That the waters that you've given inside of us will feed other gardens. But God, we don't want to do this for ourselves. We want to give you the glory. We want it to be your garden. We want it to be your field. So we're asking God to come tonight and blow upon our gardens.